Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath day. We are the Villano family, and we are so glad to be here that you can join us in singing praises to God in worship. And we have Gisela in the, on the piano here accompanying us. And uh, we pray that all of you will be blessed, and we're here to bring God glory. Over here. I'm Adam Villano. I'm Alex. I am Andre. I'm Ramon. And I'm Lena. The first song we will be singing for you is on the basis of what we, and hopefully every one of you, long for. When God brings up his faithful, awaiting to hear his words, well done, good and faithful servant. Here is triumphantly the church will rise. The stars dance with anticipation the trembling clouds know it's time musicians are tuning their instruments and the singers the pride triumph
Stamps with Poets songs are what we enjoy listening to also. And we love giving praises to God. We love the quick songs because you can usually move on to the next one quicker to sing the next praises to him. Here we are. We have um, Let There Be Praise. So we can praise God every day. Templed songs are also what we enjoy because it directs our fast paced rhythm from life into something more calm. We find ourselves more connected with Him when we take a deep breath, enjoy what is around us. And our family, uh, simply, even for our family, simply looking outside at nature and meditating on how God has made all these beautiful things for us, helps us see that he loves us. Here is his love.
It can be sometimes difficult to walk the narrow way. But when we fall, we can always come back to the path, the narrow path, no matter how difficult it may be, the path where God is. God loves every one of his children. And here we are a new name in glory. It's our prayer that someday our name will be written down in the book of life so that we can join Jesus in heaven. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory, it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to sent his son to earth to die for us sinners. He bled and died for us. His love is written in red. Oh 
are so glad. Aren't you glad that Jesus is coming soon? There's so many things happening these days. We have to endure and keep the faith and hang in there, not let go of God's hand, for Jesus is coming soon. Father in heaven, we come to you today with thanksgiving in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for being with us as we came here to glorify you. That's the only way we can keep our voices and keep our praise is to give you all the glory. We thank you so much for the Sabbath day. I pray, Lord, that the songs we've sung has touch people's hearts for them to seek you to not give up and to look forward to your second coming thank you for your love and care and coming to die for us in Jesus worthy name we pray amen happy sabbath and good morning to everyone want to say thank you to the Valania family for the beautiful special music 
And uh, thank you to Sister Evadine Peters for the invitation to come and share the Sabbath school lesson on this beautiful Sabbath day. Before we open the Word of God and get into the Sabbath school lesson, let's uh, bow our heads for a few seconds for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy, for giving us a good week. Now as we delve into the study of your word, the Sabbath school lesson for today, pray for the direction from the Holy Spirit to guide and direct that the words and thoughts that we hear not come from this human being, but come directly from you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So this week's lesson I found very fascinating, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be asked to teach because it gave me the opportunity to dig in a little bit more than normal, than usual, into God's Word and the uh, lesson study in particular. We are speaking this, um, this quarter about how God has so graciously shared His Word with us, but not only that, that He has given us principles of interpretation and given us ways to um, delve in and to understand his word in a marvelous way. And of course, the great portion of that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But the practices that we undertake, the um, principles that we apply to the interpretation of God's word are so very vital and important as we seek to understand his will explicitly through his word. So this week we're talking about... Um, creation, um, Genesis as a foundation, not only of God's word, but uh, as far as man's existence as well. And so I looked up in Wikipedia the concept of creation. And under creationism, this is what it said. Creationists do not believe that all of today's living things came about from simple organisms changing or evolving slowly over time. Creationists believe that life was created much as it is today and that one form of life cannot change into another. While most biologists and paleontologists say that fossils are different from the forms of life we see today and can be put in an order to show changes over time, young earth creationism, that was the first time I had ever heard that term, young earth creationism says life was created in a short time in its current form. And so obviously we as Christians, as followers of Christ, we believe explicitly that God created the world in seven literal days. But this week we're focusing in on some particulars of the creation story that um, probably relate to us as Seventh-day Adventists in a different way than it does even to other Christians. So the lesson began with John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, well-known verse for all of us. It says, In the beginning was, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. So the first question that leaps at us as we study the lesson this week is, what is the beginning? When was the beginning? Was it the Genesis story? Was it the creation narrative? Um, it's interesting that whereas the other three Gospels begin with the Bethlehem story, the story of the birth of Jesus, John is the only one of the four Gospels that begins with an eternal focus. And what I mean by that is, um, even though some may find quite the similarity between the Genesis story, how it begins, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and the story of Christ, how it begins in John chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1, as you well know, says, In the beginning God created, whereas John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so at face value, Genesis 1, 1 and John 1, 1, seem to be quite similar and begin virtually the same, but there's a vast difference there. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created, whereas Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. Created and was. So Genesis 1.1 begins with our beginning 
as the human race, whereas John chapter 1, verse 1, beginning, speaks to the eternity of God. He has no beginning. Wherever we might put the beginning, he's beyond that, going backwards. So the Apostle John here transports us back into eternity. And that is perhaps why there are verses in the Bible where it says, and uh, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verses 26, 28, and 30. I'll give you a moment to look that up. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 26, 28, and 30. That's an interesting section of scripture because we all believe that the word, as it says in John chapter 1, verse 1, was the creator God, Christ. And that nothing that was made was made without him. Jesus Christ is the creator God. We agree on that. But it's interesting that when we look at Proverbs chapter 8, verse 26, 28, and 30, it pictures God the Father right there with Christ when he created. And God the Father is almost taking a step back, the second seat, the co-pilot position, as he speaks about Jesus creating. Notice what it says, Proverbs 8, 26, 28, and 30. While as yet he had not made the earth, referring to Christ, or the fields, or the primal dust of the world, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, then I was beside him as a master craftsman. Beautiful passage there. At least in my mind, I just find it fascinating how God the Father, even though he is supreme, and even though Christ, when he was upon this earth, said, I do nothing of myself. I only do what the Father has shown me, what the Father has asked me to do. It's obviously within the Godhead, there's an order. They're equal, but there's an order. But here, God the Father steps back and he conveys to Christ that first role in, in creation. He says, Christ, before Christ spoke the worlds into existence, I was there with him, a master craftsman with him. So it's interesting that we find in the creation story three things basically that jump right out at us. Number one, Christ, the creator God, accompanied by the Father God, who stood back and allowed the creator God, his son, to take the lead. The Holy Spirit breathed over the face of the waters and of the earth. The three of them involved, the three of them in unity, the three of them expressing ultimate teamship. It's interesting that God created everything that existed for his honor and glory. The second thing that we see very clearly is the beginning of the world in no way indicates any semblance of what the beginning of God is. God has no beginning. And so John 1.1 1, 1 lets us know that wherever we can look back to as a beginning is just a drip in the vast existence of God. And then third, we see clearly that God had order and precision in his creation. There was nothing that was haphazard. There was nothing that was knee-jerk. Everything that God did was systematic, and it was perfect, as we'll see toward the end of the lesson. And so... We see here, as God creates the world, that he is before anything else, way before anything else that we can point to. And the renowned physicist Albert Einstein realized that. We looked at Albert Einstein as one of the, the most intelligent men who ever lived on the face of the earth. And the renowned physicist Albert Einstein, in an interview with the Saturday Evening Post, once said, as a child, I received instruction from both the Bible and the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the divine figure of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. No myth is filled with such life. Let's go to the Sunday's lesson right now, and um, it, of course, begins with the first verse of the Bible. 
Sunday's title, In the Beginning. Genesis 1.1, In the Beginning, God Created the Heavens and the Earth. Now I'm wondering if you might feel like I felt as I went over the lesson study this week. Does it not amaze you how simple the Word of God is, yet how profound it is? I don't know if there's anything else in this world that we could really point to that has such simplicity and such profoundness at the same time, the Word of God. In 2010, Newsweek magazine asked Americans the following question, do you believe God created the universe? 80% of those responding to that survey said the universe was in fact created by God. And that's great news. And it's pretty amazing that after all the money and effort spent on the teaching of evolution that the great majority of people, 8 out of 10, apparently in this country, still believe that God created the world. Carlson and Decker, those who conducted this survey, summed up the false teaching of evolution in the following way. Interesting. Notice the words, In kindergarten, we are taught that a frog turning into a prince is a fairy tale. When we get to college, we're taught that a frog turning into a prince is science. Amazing how Satan has enabled the world to teach something so contrary to the concept of the being of God, so contrary to the existence of God, and so contrary to the creation story. The author of our Sabbath school lesson this quarter also points out that the concept of time itself was established by God at creation. Apparently, prior to creation, there was no concept of time. And if, if you think about that for a second, the, the verse that we quoted earlier, O oh God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. Really, no time element is needed when you're talking about everlasting. There's no beginning, there's no end. And so time is of no factor. But we see God thinking about every detail as he creates the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 5, notice the definite references to time. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the very first unit of time that God establishes is a day and he divides it by light and by darkness. The comprehensiveness of his creative work, to think about every detail of creation, including time and the importance of time, not only as something that would be beneficial to mankind as we try to order our days, but more importantly, his recognition of time as something that would be important in our relationship with him, to be able to have that factor of time. Psalms chapter 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so the psalmist David basically is saying there, even though we have a, a strict notion of time, O oh God, and before you even established time at the beginning of this world, you were far before that, and you will be far after that. So the detail of God in creating the world, including establishing elements of time, has certainly been a blessing to mankind throughout history. Let's go now to Monday's lesson. The days of creation. We just spoke about how God established the day, Genesis 1 verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And so we see God in creation establishing these seven units of time which he called days. Now for many, sadly, even Christians, the, the whole notion of creation is just a metaphor, kind of like a, a fiction account, a fairy tale at best. But we know as Christians that to discredit the creation story is to discredit the creator God. And of course, we understand that's part of Satan's great plot to discredit the creator God. And if Satan can discredit the creator God, then he can discredit the redeeming God. And if he can re discredit the redeeming God, he can ex practically for all purposes wipe out or erase the notion of salvation or hope for mankind. And so we see Satan working feverishly against this. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. We see where the serpent, Satan, tempts Eve, the mother of the human race. And you see in what way he went about that. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God knows, Satan said to Eve, that in the day that you eat of the forbidden tree, you won't die, but your eyes will be open, and you will, notice the words, be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, it's God himself who designates this first unit of time. He designates this time that the Hebrew uses the word yom there to describe day, the 24-hour period that we understand to, to be today. But it became even more implicit and more um, vital when God establishes the seventh day Sabbath. And God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that six days, I want you to get this, even before the interests of sin and fatigue and sickness, God knew that six days would be enough to work and to hustle about and, and do what we needed to do to exist. Even before fatigue and sickness, he said, the seventh day, it would be good for you just to set aside as a blessed day of rest, of communion with me. You don't have to hustle. You can just on that seventh 24-hour period, just step aside, sit down, and commune with me. He knew that would be important. God knew that that would be something that, that would be very vital to the existence of mankind, an opportunity to come aside and to rest and to focus on him and his goodness through creation and throughout time. And so God's creation we find as we look at the Genesis story, as we look at the story of Christ upon earth in the book of John and the other gospels, we find that these things that God has created in the heavens and upon the earth have become markers which really point to the validity of creation. They have become markers that are hard to dispute on the part of evolution. I was reading that George Will, back in 1998, uh, remarking on the breathtaking wonders of the universe that the Hubble Space Telescope was revealing at that time and continues to reveal that um, many scientists and many uh, astronomers have attributed to a creator God, in fact. Not all scientists believe in evolution. And so George Will observed, he said, soon the American Civil Liberties Union or People for the American Way or some similar faction of litigious secularism will file suit against NASA charging that the Hubble Space Telescope unconstitutionally gives comfort to the religiously inclined. Interesting. Even those that are not particularly in tune with God or in tune with the Bible or religion understand as they look out into the vast space, as they look at the wonders of the world, they realize that there was a creator God indeed, that these things could not be put in a bag and shaken up and mixed together and some miraculous thing come forth, that it would take a higher power, a God, a creator God, to bring this about. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson now, the Sabbath in creation. Of course, for all of us Seventh-day Adventists, this is dear to heart, dear to heart. I, um, I'm 58 years old now, and I think back upon my childhood, what I can remember of it, my adolescence and my young adult years, adult years, and now pushing on into the advanced years, I can't think of a time where the Sabbath wasn't a part of my life. And I count that one of the great blessings and privileges that God has given me. Ellen White speaks about the blessing of the Sabbath. Testimonies, volume six, page six. She says there, um, I'm sorry, volume six, page 351. She says, the Sabbath is the golden clasp that unites God and his people. But the Sabbath command has been broken. His holy day has been desecrated. The Sabbath has been torn from its place by the man of sin. And a common working day has been instituted in its place. The Sabbath question, this is what we should hold fast to as Adventists. The Sabbath question will be the issue in the final great conflict in which the entire, entire world will participate. 
So we ask ourselves the question as we study the lesson this week and as we reflect upon the importance of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, of course, we know as we look in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 20, for example, verses 12 and verse 20, when it refers to the Sabbath being a ring, a seal, but the Hebrew word is ring, a ring of commitment between God and his people. And of course, the ancient kings used a, a ring that had their royal seal in every official document that they would uh, make official. Uh, they would take that royal seal on their ring and they would seal it. And so the Bible writer, the prophet Ezekiel, refers to the Sabbath as that official seal, that um, documentation of authenticity of God's people between he and them. So we ask ourselves the question, do we see anything today on the horizon that could represent a threat to Sabbath observance? And I think our first superficial answer would be no. Thankfully, we have religious liberty in this country. We're fine. We have no threat. But maybe a closer look would point in a different direction. September 11, 2001, was a day that changed the world, and it changed this country significantly. We can attribute all of the invasive security procedures in the airport, trace them back to September 11, 2001. We lost a lot of civil liberties that day in the interest of keeping terror, terrorism out of this country and preserving the security of the nation. We gave up some civil liberties. And so I would like to say to you that even though President George Bush signed into legislation the Patriot Act that brought on these uh, differences, there was something that happened in the year 2011 that was even more detrimental. A piece of legislation, the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, that took even more civil, civil liberties away, and it's gone, flown under the radar, and many of us don't even realize it exists. I'm going to read just a portion of that to you. This is in Wikipedia, commenting on the NDAA. It says, the executive order 13... 603, signed into law on March 16, 2012 by then-President Barack Obama, gives the federal government the legal authority to force any citizen or resident into de facto slavery. According to the executive order, the government can conscript any person of outstanding experience and ability into labor, both in peacetime as well as in times of national, national emergency, without compensation. That means if there was a national disaster, national emergency, the president or his agents could force any citizen or resident into forced labor, including labor every day or any day of the week, and our Sabbath observance could be lost. As we look to the message of the third angel, and I'm sorry we didn't get further into the lesson today, but as we look into that association, between creation and the message of the first angel. Fear God and give him the honor and glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship he who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. There is a call at the end of time to come back to a pristine worship of the only God who was responsible for creating this world. And so at the beginning, at, at creation, God established the Sabbath. Many evangelicals accuse Adventists of saying, you're keeping a Jewish Sabbath. But the fact of it is that when the Sabbath was established, there were no Jews. It was just a man and a woman. And that's why 4,000 years later, when Christ walked upon this earth, he said the Sabbath was made for man. It was made for humanity. It wasn't just made for Adventists. It wasn't just made for Jews. It was made for men and women, boys and girls everywhere. It was made to be a blessing. Jesus tried to emphasize that. The Sabbath was made for you to be a blessing, to be able to leave all the hustle and bustle aside and to be able to think about and to meditate upon Christ. I wish we'd have had time to get into the marriage issue of it. The two great blessings that God left us at creation were marriage, family, and the Sabbath. And so God definitely placed his image upon men and women. He definitely ordained there to be families. He definitely ordained there to be a marriage between one man and one woman. 
He definitely wanted it there to be happiness. But somehow today, the whole concept, the sacredness of marriage, the sanctity of the family, and the sanctity of society being governed by wholesome families is being um, warred against. It's being destroyed by many outside factions. Let's continue to pray that God only preserve, not only preserves our church, our families, but society may be kept in his hand in these last hours of history so that as we witness the final events of this world, we can be certain that we have a creator God who spoke into existence everything that we know and he can speak and speak salvation and redemption into our lives as we so need. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for a chance to get into the lesson today. I want to ask your blessing upon each one that is listening, each household, that we as families, as we as individuals, as we as church members, as members of society may give our best to you so that in doing so that we give our best to society. Bless each one and keep them in the hallow of your hands. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.